production software that are available on Linux OS's uh, as a general category. I'm going to run kind of fast because I want to get to a demo Q&A. Um, starting with DAWs or digital audio workstations. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, they represent a project as multiple layered tracks which can contain recording sound or MIDI sequences. Uh, a typical DAW also provides a piano roll interface for entering notes, recording functionality, and the ability to control the effects and software or hardware instruments. Ardor and LMMS are both free software DAWs, but uh, these days in the Linux OS space, there are also proprietary DAWs playing on the, on the uh, environment. So there's Renoise and Bitwig. Those are both proprietary. Uh, but they also run late, uh, natively on Linux desktops, and I feel like that's uh, a somewhat recent development that we're seeing more of those proprietary things move into uh, the Linux ecosystem. Um, Bitwig in particular is a very trendy DAW right now, so it's interesting to see all these non-Linuxy people that I know who are really into Bitwig having this application at the core of their workflow that could be run on uh, a Linux desktop. Um, so... DAWs use plugins. Um, if you're familiar with them, you probably know that they're like super important to a DAW because uh, they can run an entire instrument, an entire effect. And in fact, if you run the right combination of DAW plugins, you can basically just not use the DAW. Uh, so in this screenshot here, we've got, um, oops, sorry, I guess that's the wrong button for the laser pointer, but we've got um, uh, host called Carla that's actually running the DAW plugins. And Carla is very slim. It's not a DAW. It's just controlling the plugins and connecting them together. Um, so if you had a set of instruments and you might even have a plugin that does some kind of mixing for you, like you could um, basically make music uh, entirely with the plugins. And there's a, a ton of different formats. I think the one that people tend to settle on these days is DST, but basically uh, there's all these different formats that do actually run on Linux desktops. Um, but there's an alternative to plugins when you're running on a Linux desktop. Um, you can do these um, output and input patching uh, tasks yourself. So in this example, we've got a program called QPW Graph, and that is actually uh, connecting the outputs of uh, applications to the inputs of other applications. Uh, and what it's using is this metaphor to um, the cables that we would use to patch together uh, hardware. So um, in a modular synthesizer, or if you're connecting a guitar to a pedal, or uh, anything more complicated than that in a music hardware setup, you know, you'd be connecting cables together to create different configurations. And uh, we just extend that to a visual metaphor uh, in uh, QJack control uh, originally uh, for the Jack audio server that we'll talk about later. Um, but these days with Pipewire coming in and uh, in many cases replacing Jack, um, they've uh, got QPW graph, uh, which just uses the same metaphor but applies it to the newer audio interface. Um, we've also got music trackers. So uh, if you ever looked at how music is made for old school console video games, uh, like the NES or um, even um, not strictly consoles like the Commodore 64, uh, then you might recognize the tracker setup. Basically, it's um, defining things in terms of events rather than notes per se. So, um, so you'll see in this complicated screenshot, there are notes. Um, but um, they're just part of a data, the part of the data for each event. So um, you've got this whole grid of events that's being run through sequentially. You can have control events that move things backward and forward in the timeline. Um, but on Linux, we have these. Um, in particular, there's Schism Tracker, which um, is a clone of something that's kind of ancient by computer standards called Impulse Tracker, which was a proprietary DOS application. But Schism Tracker is um, free software, and it's out there. Uh, there's also a relative newcomer called Famous Studio, which just kind of emulates how things happened on the NES. Um, and you can run that on uh, your Linux system as well. There's even uh, also an Android version of it if you want to try it on mobile. Um, in terms of audio editors, of course, we've got 
Audacity, it's kind of a juggernaut. It's been around forever. Um, and you probably, if you uh, know a lot of people who work on audio, you probably know people who use it on Mac OS or on Windows, but it's been in the Linux ecosystem uh, since the beginning. And we've got scoring and notation applications. Uh, so the big example of this is uh, MuseScore. It is a commercial application, um, and we could call it uh, an open core or like freemium kind of application. So um, there's a desktop application for MuseScore that is uh, GPL licensed, um, and that's definitely open source in that sense. Uh, but there's also an online hub for sharing music, and that's a commercial thing, and that's proprietary. And there's um, proprietary mobile versions of it. So that's how they uh, that's how they support their business model. Um, but uh, it's a very fully developed um, system, and they recently came out with, I think it was version 4, uh, that's really upgraded a lot of things in the interface. So you may have heard about that. There's also um, other projects kicking around out there that maybe don't have a commercial presence. So there's Rose Garden. Uh, I've used that. It's a pretty simple notation editor that can send MIDI to different um, parts of your device. Uh, there's Lily Pond, which is more like uh, text for um, notation editing. So basically, you have a text format that will be um, converted into, um, sorry, into staves, and you'll have uh, the notation output from that. Uh, and I just recently found out there's a, an application called Tux Guitar that's just for doing guitar tabs. So that's pretty cool. Um, in terms of transcoders and utilities, like the big one I would want to mention is FFmpeg. So like, you can use it just to transcode things. You can say, I want this uh, FLAC file turned into a compressed like Opus file um, for distributing on the web or whatever. But um, it actually has a really advanced filter system. So you can combine all kinds of filters and create audio visualizations. You can, um, you can do fairly advanced editing things, normalizing uh, the audio or applying different effects. Um, so for that reason, it's sometimes at the core of like a more fully fledged editor with a whole interface. Um, and there are also live performance applications. So um, for that, I wanted to mention Pure Data, which is a language, a, a visual programming language for uh, creating multimedia uh, interactive uh, art installations, et cetera. Uh, et cetera. So uh, people do use that for making music. There's this uh, screenshot is just kind of like the main example that you would find on like Wikipedia. And you can see there's like a ton of different modules open. So basically, this is um, a way to uh, do DSP or digital signal processing, where you've got all kinds of different modules connected to each other and um, operating on the continuous audio signal in different ways. Um, it's like composing functions, basically. So um, one example of something that people have done with uh, this kind of digital signal processing uh, is like oscilloscope music. I don't know if the, if the uh, example I'm thinking of is someone who used it on a Linux desktop specifically, but, uh, but this is the kind of technique that creates, um, like if you've ever heard of someone named Jerobeam Fenderson, uh, he created uh, this famous oscilloscope music where um, the music is specifically composed to create images on an oscilloscope when it's hooked up with the you know left uh, channel in one input and the right channel in another. Uh, and it creates all kinds of beautiful graphics while also sounding interesting. It's um, hard to do. It involves 3D modeling. Um, so there's also a VCV rack. And that's something I wanted to try to demonstrate a little bit today. Uh, so that's another way of doing digital signal processing. And what it's doing there is really um, copying the the experience of using modular synthesis hardware, so particularly Eurorack. So uh, in Eurorack, you've got um, physical devices that you hook into a rack, like a server rack, um, and you're patching them together with patch cables. Um, you're turning the knobs to the positions that you want, and you know each one of them 
can have particular uh, functions that per they perform on the um, sorry on the um, audio signal, like the nodes in pure data here. Um, but um, you can combine them in all kinds of unexpected ways. So that's the philosophy behind VCV rack. That's another open core kind of thing. Um, but Cardinal is um, an open source fork of VCV rack um, that focuses on making it uh, a DAW plugin primarily, whereas um, the open source free version of VCV rack is a standalone application. And then there's, um, there's a, propri a proprietary version that functions as uh, a DAW plugin, but also has access to various proprietary plugins. Um, it's it's an app store like experience where the platform that you're using is open source, but the plugins could be proprietary, uh, could be under any license. Um, so I just wanted to briefly touch on the audio interfaces themselves that are underneath all of this. Um, I won't go into the history too much, but um, basically we've got over time a system of different uh, interfaces that have popped up. Um, these days, you know, uh, these different interfaces might not always interact with each other well when they're installed side by side on the same system. Like it's possible that they don't always uh, mesh. So um, a user might be uh, using ALSA for handling MIDI sequences but then using Jack to provide low latency audio connections in their production workflow between uh, their DAW and other applications or, um, or between, you know, like a, a mastering application and a recording application. So um, they'd have those two. And then additionally, they might have pulse audio just for intuitively handling uh, things like your microphone connection when you're connecting to a casual video game session or like doing video conferencing. Um, and that's become a little bit untenable. So what has happened recently is that Pipewire has kind of emerged uh, to supplant these systems, uh, not by like outdoing them, but by uh, supporting the interfaces that they created. So um, when you're running Pipewire, you can have it emulate the interface of uh, ALSA, Jack, and Pulse Audio. And then applications that connect to those um, will be able to connect to Pipewire using the same uh, API, essentially. Um, so this, the emergence of Pipewire, which is fairly recent, is the thing that is making me more comfortable recommending Linux to musical friends than I used to be over like anything else. Um, there's also system level tweaks that you can do uh, when you're working on music on a Linux desktop. Uh, you can go so far as to recompile your kernel so that um, it's fully preemptible so that you can give uh, audio, like real-time audio applications top priority and they can interrupt anything that's happening in the system. Um, then there's like much smaller tweaks like just adding that your primary user to the um, audio user group. Um, but uh, it can get complicated and there's this script out there, RTCQS, that will just give you a list of everything that is or isn't configured in an optimal, uh, an optimal way for music production. Um, but instead of working with all that, you can also install a dedicated music production OS where things are configured for you out of the box. So a popular example of that is Ubuntu Studio. Um, and I wanted to mention that they've just switched over to Pipewire. They considered it mature enough uh, in April for them to uh, incorporate it as a core component of Ubuntu Studio um, now that it's like past its 1.0. Um, there's also Fedora Jam uh, that I recently learned about. So that's a Fedora spin um, that is also focused on music. Um, and I use NixOS personally. So um, NixOS is not an o uh, a music dedicated OS, but I found that someone created a module for uh, NixOS where I could uh, install this module and it would do these configuration steps for me, including every time I do a system upgrade, it's compiling a fully preemptible kernel for me, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, I wanted to quickly transition to a demo. So let's see if I can... So this is VCV Rack. Um, 
we're starting out with uh, just a simple triangle wave. Uh, so if you look at the virtual oscilloscope in the top left, um, that's the triangle wave we're working with. And I have it muted right now. So that red line is the actual audio output. Uh, and if I raise the if I raise the volume and unmute this, um, okay. I think I switched. Uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> I switched it yet again. Um, sorry. There we go. Sorry, I forgot to turn up the master volume. That wasn't even Linux. That was me uh, forgetting how my mixer works. So um, here we've got the triangle wave running. And you can see the red line is just attenuated a little bit. So it's the same triangle wave, but uh, the volume has been lowered a tiny bit, essentially. Um, and what we're going to do now is first start the clock. So we've got um, just a simple um, ticking, like a, a slow square wave, basically. Uh, running a sequencer that's random. So it's going to start sending different um, voltages to control the frequency of that triangle wave. Uh, it takes a, a moment to sort of build up different things. But in the meantime, I'm going to take the uh, signal of the triangle wave, and I've just applied a very simple envelope to it. Uh, in this case, I'm really just turning it on and off based on whether there's... Uh, a gate signal coming out of our sequencer, uh, so it's not just constantly on. And then if I turn another crossfader here, I'm applying two ADSR envelopes. So this is just what digital signal processing is. Um, and I've also got a knob I can fiddle with here to um, adjust the amount of FM on it. So um, I've got some randomized FM that's just kind of making the sound a little bit wobbly, changing the frequency or the tone. And I've got another knob that just adds a ton of reverb. So uh, this is all independent modules interacting on uh, the audio signal. This is what digital signal processing is. Uh, it's not actually that complicated. <laughs> um, so now that we've got a basic idea of what the chain looks like, uh, I'd like to add in some hi-hat and some kick drum. And this, um, sorry, this right here, this uh, signal processor, um, or this part of the signal processing chain, is what's creating the actual, um, the actual um, notes and actual gates that are controlling uh, when it's on or off. Um, so I've got the voltage going to. Uh, the VCO that's actually creating the triangle wave, and that's changing the uh, tone of it. But I've also got the VCO, um, I've also got the volt per octave, that is the, the frequency, uh, hooked up to another oscillator. So this one is um, a sine wave, uh, essentially, just a, a little complication to the sine wave, but mostly just a sine wave. Um, so I'm going to bring that up, and it's just a base. I've turned it down an octave. It's not not that complicated, but I've also um, also got it all hooked into the effects chain. So now we've got several voices, and they're all just kind of controlled by this one sequencer. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's, um, that's enough talking, I guess. I can just let it run for a minute, and then we can have a Q&A. Um, yeah, so this is an example of uh, generative um, technique where I'm not composing anything. I'm not really doing anything special. Um, what I'm doing is taking randomness and just controlling it uh, by you know, confining it to a given scale. So um, in, pr in particular, I've got uh, Proteus here as the sequencer, and I've given it a specific scale. So even though it's generating randomness, it's only uh, quantizing notes to that given that given scale, and then I'm just coordinating that between different uh, different modules.
I have um, the capability of hooking up other hardware. Um, I didn't give myself quite enough time to get the um, to get their hardware online. So <laughs> um, trust me that it uh, it does uh, it does work when I'm in the right environment and actually spend the time to hook it up correctly. But um, but I can when I have that set up, what I can do is send the voltage to a uh, hardware modular synthesizer, uh, and then using different uh, modules in hardware, I can create audio signals that are then drawn in uh, to VC Viria can become part of the chain. All right, this is the end of my uh, this is the end of my demo. I'm just gonna take everything down a bit. Um, so I'd like to move into questions if anybody has any. Hi. Yes. Uh, not personally. I tend to use this. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. I will repeat the question. So um, the question is whether I have experience trying to get uh, different VSTs, different kinds of DAW plugins uh, that might not be compiled for a Linux OS specifically to run through Wine, etc. Um, and the answer is uh, not really, just because I tend to work in a DAWless setup. But um, there's um, a surprising number of VSTs that support it natively these days. I don't, you know, because I'm not shopping for them most of the time, I can't tell you which ones they are, but like, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, you know, if I look into what people are running on Carla, that, that VST host, there's like, you know, it's not, it's not crickets, right? <laughs> there's, there's stuff there. I don't know if it's the stuff that people want to run because I'm not working in that space most of the time. But it's not like an empty. Um, it's not an empty thing. It's um, at least some plugins running in there, um, and VCV Rack itself, like I said, can be a plugin that works fine natively under Linux. Um, I wish I had a more satisfactory answer from like actually using DAWs all the time. That's uh, the next step in my music journey, I guess. Does anyone have a, a different question? Hello. Yes. Yeah, so the question is whether uh, something like I just showed where I'm uh, emulating uh, Eurorack hardware, modular synthesizer hardware in VCV rack if that can actually replace the hardware entirely? And the answer is essentially yes. I've produced tracks. Uh, you'll have to judge the quality on your own. But using entirely VCV rack and no hardware um, outside that at all, um, it, it's certainly possible. Um, the reasons that people might still use hardware uh, vary. Like there are some things that um, are difficult to emulate. Like, uh, for example, I've got a piece of hardware right here that has a contact microphone in it. So that kind of thing, it, you're specifically um, touching it in ways that you wouldn't be doing with VCV rack. Um, and it's it's more of a tactile instrument in that way. Um, so that that's the sort of thing that you might go to hardware for specifically, or just because you find that the knobs are exactly the way you want them for the experience of actually making the music. So it tends to be more like intangible stuff like that that people find they can't replace. But in practice, you can do like an all virtual setup. Um, and it's much cheaper to do that than to use any of this hardware. <laughs> uh, sorry.
Oh yeah, so that um, that demonstration that I showed you, um, yeah, so the question is whether if I have a demonstration like I just showed, if I can um, if I can actually share that um, as a file or something instead of just explaining how I made it and hoping that someone else can do that. So the answer is yes, I can share it as a file. Um, that demo I made, I uh, put the patch file, as it's called, um, on Pretox, so it's up there. Um, unfortunately, I did not like put in notes explaining how to use it, uh, which uh, I would have done if I spent more time on that bit. Um, but um, but that's something that people do. Um, there's a website called Patch Storage that's basically a social network just for sharing these patch files. Um, and the thing that tends to limit that is like if you're using VCV rec with commercial or proprietary modules, you might be using some that someone else doesn't have. So, um, so you have to either you know choose ones that are all like free and open source that everyone can obtain, or you have to say like, uh, look, you might not have this module and you might have to replace it. Um, so in that in that sense, it's not so different pe from people who are uh, playing a game like. Uh, uh, the Sims or something, <laughs> where they're using different different packs that other people might not have. I just think of that example because I'm around kids playing The Sims all the time at home. Um, any other questions? Oh yes. Um, the question is about uh, compiling fully preemptible kernels, and I don't know if I entirely caught it. You're you're asking about about issues with that with that fully preemptible kernel. Um, I I don't I don't know if these are the same issues that you're asking about, but I have seen cases where basically um, a particular system just can't run on the fully preemptible kernel. <laughs> um, like um, I have. I have a personal laptop that I don't use for work stuff that I do uh, run on this fully preemptible kernel, but I don't use it for like work tasks. I keep them separate because I have seen issues like that in practice. Um, but because uh, I have it implemented into my system configuration um, in NixOS, I can roll back if something doesn't work. And also, um, it, it's part of the system upgrade process, so I don't have to put effort into it each time recompiling the kernel myself. If I did, I wouldn't bother. <laughs> uh, okay, so the, the question is, if I observe latency issues when I run it on uh, a normal kernel, and to be honest, I haven't done like thorough A-B testing. The fact is I experience latency issues a lot in general, <laughs> so uh, so it's a little hard to say what's the thing that really clinches it. I just do everything that's possible to reduce latency. Um, that's why I mentioned that RTCQS script. It's telling you what what should be just about everything that you can do, and I just try to do everything in that list. Yeah, so the kernel was just one example I gave because I feel like it's kind of an extreme example of something you can do, but there's other stuff like setting up UDEV rules and just making sure that you have exactly the right driver for any piece of hardware that you're using. Um, it's um, a whole set of tasks, and the kernel is just one piece of it. Well, oh, yes. So the question is, um, who's making these commercial modules that are available for a program like VCV Rec, um, where you know what they're doing is basically copying uh, things that exist in hardware? Um, and the question is whether that's 
people who also make the actual hardware or if it's people who are participating in a completely different market? Um, and the answer is it's both, basically. So there's, uh, for example, a really popular maker of hardware modules called Instruo, uh, based in Ireland. And um, Instruo uh, also makes VCV rec versions of a number of their modules. Um, I, a lot of those are actually free on VCV rec. I think some of them are not, uh, that's free as in beer. I don't know if it's actually um, open source. But um, I think we're out of time. Um, so that uh, concludes my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>